Hello and welcome back to my podcast. I'm your host Salvatore and today I'll be joined by Emily as my co-host as well. Now today we are honoured to be asking questions to a very special guest who is Janine Weber. Janine is with the Holocaust Educational Trust and she regularly shares her testimony with schools across the country. So thank you and thank you Anna who works with the Holocaust Educational Trust as well for joining us today. Um, thank you. First of all, Janine, how has your lockdown been? <laughs> yeah, good question. Well, <laughs> you know, I I, uh, I got a bit worried at the very beginning because I my surgery phoned me and they said to me, you will have to be shielded. And I thought, no, I cannot. I must go out. I must go walking. I cannot sort of stay at home. And uh, because I suppose my age to start with. And I, and the doctor who phoned me, he knows me. And he said, well, you, you don't want to be shielded. I said, no. So, OK, that's OK. So you can then be very careful. I said, yes, I am careful. So after that, it was I, I felt better because I like walking yeah. and I go walking every day and I'm very lucky to have a lovely park where I live. So I go walking and every so often I uh, give talks on Zoom and I managed with, to learn to use Zoom. So mm -hmm. I'm fine. I feel um, obviously it's not the same as seeing people course, and looking yeah. at them. This is just the seeing photos, really, mm -hmm. sort of uh, film. Uh, but uh, anyway, I think I, I'm, I managed, okay. I go, I go walking every morning for about two hours. And then, you know, I listen to various things. There are a lot of lectures on, uh, uh, um, sort of thing which I am member of it's called the lockdown university and mm -hmm. there are lectures on art on, on history and so there are lectures every day so I spend a lot of time listening to the lectures as well oh, so nice. that's good so yeah. I'm, I manage quite well and I have a son who lives in London and uh, he, uh, we, we are in a bubble together, so he ah. would come. And uh, now I meet him in London. Now I, I did it uh, two, two, three, two days ago. And yes, yeah, so I, I think I'm all right. <laughs> Thank you. And um, so what I've done is I've, I've sent out a link to um, everybody to try and watch your testimony as well. We've watched your testimony as well. So I'm just going to ask you a few questions from that. And the um, okay. first one I have is what was the community like in your hometown before the split of Poland? Well, uh, before 1939, that happened in 1939, when the war started and Russia and, and Germany as you might have learned in, in history, they, they divided Poland into two. Mm -hmm. So this was before 39. I was before, obviously, uh, I uh, in 39, I was seven. So this was before. Well, uh, I lived, obviously, my family was Jewish. And uh, uh, it was a fairly sort of ordinary family, I suppose. Uh, my both my parents worked so my grandmother used to take care of me and uh, I, it was we we would go once a year we would go on holiday which was to the to a small village generally not very far from Lvov where I was born and uh, I have a few photos which I like you might have seen seen some and uh, uh, it was, uh, and I started learning to play the piano. I think my parents were, must have been quite keen on education. Uh, although we didn't have very much money, we had a very modest flat. My mother had a very big family 
and she was very fond of her family. So quite often, I would we would meet with um, uh, one, her, one of her sisters lived in the same building. So we would meet uh, in their flat and uh, it was a very peaceful life, not a very exciting life, I would think. I mean, that I had exciting moments. And I remember my mother took me to, to the cinema and you know, it was extraordinary. And I mean, maybe I don't know if you have grandmother or great grandparents, I don't know, they might remember. She, um, what's her name? Uh, Shirley. Oh, yeah. Shirley God, Temple. Shirley yeah. Temple, you know. Yeah. So this was before, I must have been maybe five or six. And I will never forget that moment. Thank you. Thank um, you. I think Emily, yeah. you've got one next. Yeah, we have a question from one of our teachers, Mr. Curran, and he asks, when did you realize how serious your situation was? Yes, well, uh, to start with, because I, I, I lived in Eastern Poland in Lwów, the Russians came. But then I, I for me, it, it was quite interesting. Uh, I was seven. The only thing is I went, I was sent to school because as you know, Polish children, a lot of them, they start school at seven. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1939, they, there was a little bit of bombardment. The Germans bombarded Lov, but not very much. But I remember, my mother uh, holding my hand and my brother's hand was two years younger and we were running down into the cell of the building and you know i remember my mother being sick she was so obviously frightened she knew what it meant i suppose i didn't and then i realized it was serious when the first time uh, the Germans, the Gestapo, uh, they were rounding up men. And when my father came in, running, running, and he said, the Germans after me, and uh, he decided in order to hide, to jump from our second floor balcony onto the first floor and hid underneath. And that's where I realized, for the, and then the Gestapo came, they didn't find my father and they left. That's when I realized that it was very serious. And that's when, when I asked my mother, she, I didn't know why they did this. And she said, it's because we, we are Jewish. And you know, for me, I was surprised because I never asked myself any questions about my Jewishness. And um, so also I heard then there were talks about camps, but I had no idea what kind of camps they were. So that was my first experience. Thank you. And um, then after that, as if you've watched the um, testimony as well, we learn of your, your um, sad um killing of your father and your uh, mother yes. as well and I just wanted to ask how did you cope without your mother and father and your close family yes yes well uh, you heard that my father was shot but not outside the, the where we were we were hiding in this little house in my grandmother and my, then my mother died in the ghetto mm. and she she was hiding um, my uncle was hiding her because she became ill and uh, then uh, so I I went down to see her and that's when I my uncle told me I saw her I don't know if she was still alive or not my uncle told me that she was that she had died um how did I cope you know 
I was very upset seeing my mother about my mother because um, you know I was I just was a tart. Obviously, she was my mother, and she, mm -hmm. but then people around me were dying. Yeah. My cousin's parents, everybody, you know, the, it was so terrible, the ghetto. So there were so many people. I will just uh, ha make this a little bigger here. Okay. My, uh, people were bodies, corpses were lying on the pavement. And, you know, I, I, I don't remember I never cried. I just, I was always frightened. That was my main emotion, frightened and trying to, to hide, not to be caught. Thank you very much. And um, why do you think the Gestapo soldier um, let you live? Yes, the one who, yes, this Polish woman, who was hiding my brother and me. And my uncle was paying them. And uh, I, when he, they brought him the daughter and I, I, I knew, I thought I was going, he, he was going to shoot us. And I don't know why he didn't want to kill me. I, I don't know. She, the, the daughter, the, the woman, wanted him to kill me and to kill my brother, and they killed my brother. But they, he didn't want to for some reason. And I sometimes I wonder, maybe he had a sister, a small sister, mm. or a daughter, um, or he knew a little girl you know, German girl, I, or maybe he just felt sorry for me. I don't know. He just didn't kill me. Mm. And I, it, it's terrible thing that they killed my brother. Absolutely. Who yeah. was so seven. And maybe because he thought, oh, she's a girl. She will not fight of us. Who knows? They never gave me an explanation. They just, he told me to go, to start walking. And that's when I was sure he was going to shoot. And he didn't. So I don't know why. I don't know. Mm. And, and uh, throughout your, um, your, your journey through this, you, you had a lot of people that helped you as well, um, like Edik and uh, a lot of people. Do you know what happened to them after? Well, the only person who helped me, knowing that I was Jewish, was Edik, or yes. Edik, as one would say in Polish, Edik. The others, the Polish family, one, the first one, they were my aunt and I, we, we hid. They knew I was Jewish. They kept me for a while, but then, I mean, they didn't want to keep me, to hide me. So then I had to go back to the ghetto, but they, they might, I might, might have stayed with them for two or three months. And uh, that was, Anyway, I, I'll tell you, I don't know, I'll tell you what happened, because normally I, I, uh, I think you have heard, and um, I don't normally tell this little story, but I, I will tell you because obviously you're adults, both of you. And Thank you. They, uh, we were hiding in the stables and the farmer came and he obviously uh, had an eye on my aunt who was, then she was about 18. She was a young woman and attractive young woman. And he, he obviously came to, to rape her. And uh, 
she was so terrified. I didn't know what it all meant, but I could see that she was frightened and she was begging him to let her go. And she ran out and I was left alone. So they put me in a room and there was a bed with their son who was about maybe 15 or 16, a young adolescent. And I don't know what was the idea, but he started sort of, when we were both lying trying to sleep, he started sort of bothering me. And uh, I said to him, leave me alone. And he wouldn't. So I said, I got up and found this stick and I said, if you don't stop bothering me, touching me, I will hit you. And so I put the stick between us and then he didn't do anything. But the next morning they locked me in the room. And uh, after maybe two months, they, they threw me out. The other families where I lived, they didn't know I was Jewish mm -hmm. because then after coming out of, uh, I eventually found Edek and he, he was yeah. hiding 14 Jews. He knew we were all Jewish. But then when I found the convent where I went for one night in Lvov, they didn't know I was Jewish, that the priest, who, where I lived for, for a while, didn't know I was Jewish, because by then I knew the Catholic prayers. Uh, nobody knew where I worked as a maid, when I finished up as a maid, they, they, wish, they thought I was a Christian. They sent me to church. I did my communion, you know. And they, they didn't know. They were, when my aunt came to fetch me, six months after the war and it, there was a lot of anti-semitism in Poland yeah. and at first she didn't want to tell them that she was that we were Jewish because she was frightened because some Poles killed Jews even after the war so she didn't want to tell them but they didn't want to let me go they said I belong to them because they said I lived with them and I'm like a daughter to them. So then my aunt said, we are Jewish. And they were very surprised and they let me go. Wow, yeah. And, and it's uh, just so many like experiences you, mm -hmm. you had at a a young age it's just incredible yes. that someone so young would have to go through that and what effect has that had on you throughout your life well I have always been frightened yeah of being persecuted mm -hmm. even after the war even when I came to England and uh, I, I had problems with telling people I was Jewish. I didn't want people to know because in a way I was, this was my biggest problem. I was frightened that if they learn I'm Jewish, they might start hurting me. Yeah. So I am a bit of a, paranoid I think from that point of view but I think much less since I started speaking but then I had to have uh, some help from mm. a, psycho a psychologist a psychotherapist who helped me when who who uh, advised me to to start speaking about it but yes, that was the, my biggest problem to not to be frightened, to, to tell people that I am Jewish. 
you know, and I'm a normal person. But exactly. at work, for instance, uh, people didn't know that I was Jewish, where I came from. They didn't know about my past. And one of my colleagues towards the end, I was going to, to uh, nearly retirement, and she said, um, well, I don't know very much about you. What happened? So I said, well, I, I'm Jewish. And she said, really? And she was most very surprised that I, I was, I, I admitted that was Jewish, yes. Thank you. And do you feel as though your experience as a survivor has shaped your perspective and the way that you view things? <clears throat> and if so, how? It might have. I am very concerned about what's going on in the world, about racism, anti-Semitism. I'm very worried about it. It might have, I don't know how I would have been otherwise, but it most likely did shape, yes. Um, I have two sons. I. Well, I never sat down and uh, to tell them my story, you know, because I, I've always been worried that they might get very upset and uh, very insecure. It might make them insecure. I mean, they know my story now, but it's not that because my story, I, I, I gave a uh, an interview and it was recorded on, then it was on a video i mean it's it's my sons who asked me to do this they felt i ought to tell my story so they know but we don't talk about it but i don't know in what way it has shaped me but i think i'm very concerned about the situation now in the world. I'm very, very concerned about the future, about the future for my children and grandchildren and their life. Yes. Thank you, that's a good question. And um, what made you move over to the United Kingdom after all of this? Yes. Well, something very banal, very ordinary. I did uh, study English, you know, for, for seven years at school. It was obviously uh, now when I thought afterwards, because eventually I became myself, I became a, a, a teacher and uh, how badly it was taught that I knew gra the grammar, I could read, understood a lot, but when it came to speaking and understanding when people spoke, it, I, I just couldn't. So I decided to come to England just for a few months. In fact, because I didn't have very much money, I decided to, to, to find a family to be an au pair for three months. And after three months, by uh, accident, by chance, I met an Englishman through a friend, and uh, we decided to eventually to get married, and uh, and that's what happened. So it, it's not a very sort of unusual story. We got married, and. Uh, I stayed in England. At first we started living in Paris because I lived in Paris. And I, we started living for a few months in Paris, but his French wasn't that good. So eventually we came back and uh, I had my children. And I've lived in England ever since. And uh, I like living here. I love London, I live in London. I love London. It's there's so much to do in London. It's so interesting. It is, I agree, yeah. 
Are you a Londoner? No, we, we're near it though. Yeah, we're not too far. Not too far, yeah. Okay, lovely, lovely. Um, if there is one thing that you hope people would take from learning about the Holocaust, what would it be? Yes, first of all, I would like them to remember what happened. Because you know, I mean, you know that six million Jews were perished. In Poland, three million. Over 90% of the Jewish population perished. In Lvov, even more, because they had against them not only the Germans, they had against them the Ukrainians who were very anti Semitic. And uh, so to remember. And uh, of course, you ambassadors will be able to tell my story when I'm dead, when I'm gone. And I'm very happy about it. But also I would like people to stand up to persecution, to bullying, not to accept that some people, because they are slightly different, a different religion or different color of the skin, they look different. They, they haven't got the same rights or they are not as humane as they are. So I would like people to be a little more understanding, a little more tolerant. I mean, there's so much injustice going on in this world mm. and one has to, to do something about it. And really you are our future. So, you, the, the world we are living is not wonderful, but I have great hopes in young people. And that and that um, links on to my next question as well, because okay. you said at the end of your testimony that you try to teach your sons to be understanding, to be tolerant, yeah. and not to persecute people who had religions or a different. Uh, color of skin this is a yeah. very important message and statement as well yeah. and yeah. why do you think there is racism and more specifically anti-semitism still in today's society you know it's such a difficult question yeah and uh, I can't I mean uh, people who are racist frighten me really and anti-Semitic. I mean, you know that uh, people who look differently, I mean, they're just ordinary people. Exactly. We yeah. come from the same background. We all have, I mean, as sometimes I'm saying, we, we all, some religious people believe we are all children of Adam and Eve. People who are not religious believe we descend from the monkeys, but we are all humans. And it's mm. so difficult to accept that some people feel superior. They have to persecute people who are slightly different. You know, it's, it's such a, an important question. If you ask somebody who is anti-Semitic, why? they wouldn't be able to answer. They wouldn't know because they don't realize themselves what mm. it means disliking a, a, a minority. For what? For what reason? It's a very, very important question. And maybe you can answer. What would you say if somebody put this question to you? Um, well, personally, I... I've, I've just been I've been trying to to figure this out over the past few months and I asked um, Anna in one of the uh, seminars that we did I asked her I, I don't get why why Jewish people why do people need to be anti-semitic I really don't know and, and and nobody can really answer that question it's a, a hard question to answer really well unfortunately <clears throat> I, I don't know. I suppose you are not Jewish. No, no. 
Um, but you see, the Jews, unfortunately, have been persecuted through history. Mm. They started being persecuted. Well, it happened even before, I'm told, even in Egypt when, before, but especially the Christian church started persecuting or, or, or calling the killers of, of Christ, you know, things like that. This has been going on for hundreds of years. And of course, now, for, for centuries, the priest at the pulpit was, shared, was calling the Jews the killers of Jesus. Of course, it has changed, fortunately. <clears throat> mm. Nowadays, you know, uh, of course, a lot of Christians, a lot of uh, priests are very humane and, and they know it's not right. They know that they shouldn't sort of create this atmosphere of, of persecution. Um, but that's unfortunately, that's what happened. And because of that, they, they really had a difficult time. For instance, they were thrown out, the Jews, as you know, I don't know if you remember from uh, British history, in two, um, 1299, I think, they were thrown out of England, all the Jews. So they left to other countries. And it's only when Cromwell came to power in 1500 and something that he allowed the Jews to come back. And that's what happened in a lot of countries. Somehow, because they had a different religion, they were not allowed to do certain professions. And because they, they were only allowed by the Christians to lend money. And, you know, and this created a lot of problems because people, they owed, they had these debts and they didn't want to give them back the money. So it was easier to kill them or get rid of them. You see, it's quite a complicated Mm. question actually yes yeah, and um well it's yeah i mean it would it's i'm not sure if anybody will be able to ever answer that question to its full it's it's very complicated and a lot of different yeah. views on it but um exactly exactly yeah, it's, it's hard and and we'll, we'll try our best as young people to try and you know do the best that we can to to help yeah and, yeah and yeah and um just going on to we've got a final question um yeah. by our teacher mr curran as well and coming out of lockdown a time which we have been able to reflect on life are you optimistic about humanity <laughs> yes and no <laughs> <laughs> yes because there are an awful lot of people who are very good people, who care a lot about climate change, about helping others, you know, like there are a lot of organizations. Uh, one of the organizations I, I support is Médecins Sans Frontières, you know, Doctors Without Borders. I mm -hmm. met them when I went to some of the developing countries. So um, there are a lot of people who are really very good, who are risking their lives to help people. Edek risked his life, and there are people like that. He wasn't the only one. However, there are so many problems. And uh, with, I mean, we are told about the climate, you know, it's so worrying, this question. And uh, some people don't believe it. Some people even deny about uh, the persecution of the Jews, you know. So there are, so when I say yes and no, I want to say yes, I want to be optimistic, but inside me there is a little fear that there are still some people who, who do a lot of harm, yeah. you know, who. Uh, who who deny that the Holocaust happened, you know, who, who deny my family's death. 
exactly and and also i'm not sure if anybody's seen but over the weekend or past weekend in london yes. there was um anti-mask anti-lockdown protests but they were using yeah. the yellow jewish uh symbol to uh to, to spread their message and that's completely wrong to do and and that doesn't when you look at that you think how how can we see humanity as optimistic when this is going on in the heart of our community as well yes exactly however i see you and it gives me a lot of hope and you know and i feel you make me feel good so Exactly. And there are people like you. I mean, my, my sons are very much concerned, both of them, about what's going on. My grandsons, too. So, yeah. So thank you very much for what you're doing and your interest. We really need you. And I have a lot of hope with you, people like you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And... Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Janine, thank for you. answering yes, our questions. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely meeting you. And thank, thank you, you Anna, for organizing it. That's very kind of you, Anna. Anna oh, is wow. you're always a great supporter and great help. <laughs> well, Janine, the pleasure is all ours. And I, I think you'll agree, Janine, that Emily and Salvatore's questions were, were wonderful. They were absolutely very really, important really very important and really difficult <laughs> some <laughs> of them but uh, yes very good thank you yeah. very much thank you we really appreciate you coming on to the podcast thank as well so thank you thank you thank you